Tonight, uh, we're fortunate enough to have, once again, Mike Dixon as our speaker. Mike is a past member of the Society's Board of Trustees and attended the Gross Point Public Schools before completing his high school education at Cranbrook. Uh, that's in some other community uh, near Detroit. Anyway, uh, Mike holds a BA in General Studies from the University of Michigan and a Master's in International Management from the American Graduate School of International Management in Arizona, an institution that some of you may know as the Thunderbird Group. He was then chosen um, for an organization of American Studies Fellowship in Brazil, where he met his wife Clara, a native of Venezuela, who was also attending the same program. This would explain his other hobby, which we're going to let him pass these pamphlets out tonight, Mike's World Tours uh, of South and uh, Central America and uh, Spain at this point he's added also. Uh, tonight, tonight Mike will present uh, a fascinating program on his latest book, Motormen and Yachting, The Waterfront Heritage of the Automobile Industry. Mike's previous books include Life at the Flats, The Golden uh, Era of the St. Clair River Delta, which is an anthology of a few of his books, including uh, of his uh, oldest books, uh, his first books, which he put them together into one book, Marshland Memories, Life at the Flats, and the Flats Golden Era. And then the most recent book before this one, When Detroit Rode the Waves, a summer cruise from Toledo to Port Huron, uh, and it's about the excursion boats of the early 20th century in this area. As you'll learn tonight, Mike's latest book, which includes 190 uh, wonderful illustrations, explains the development of the lightweight internal combustion engine suitable for personal marine transportation, and the involvement of automobile pioneers like Ransom Oles, David Buick, Henry Ford, Henry Leland, of course, founder of both Cadillac and Lincoln, Charles Brady King, the first uh, person to drive a car on the streets of Detroit about three months before Henry Ford, and Henry B. Joy of Packard, of course, uh, the uh, elders here of, of this mansion were also Packard people, and then uh, Gottlieb uh, Daimler, Daimler uh, were all involved in the early marine engine industry. Mike is currently working on a history of the Gray Marine uh, Motor Company, and after his presentation, he will be available to answer questions. Uh, without any further uh, introduction, I'll ask Mike to come up. Thank you. I don't have much more to say after that. <laughs> uh, um, I think what I'll do first is just um, go over the, the, how I got to doing this and then explain the book a little bit. Because my slides, uh, um, since I went to digital a number of years ago, and I've been finding it impossible to put a good slideshow together. But uh, there's some. Um, as, as Mike m mentioned, I did Life at the Flats, or a series of books about Harstens Island St. Clair Flats first. And I really, do you need the microphone? Yes, okay. yes. And I really started out doing a scrapbook that um, got carried away and um, led to the first one just doing the part of the flats where I spent summers growing up and, and um, was really recreating my, my youth. And then I said, okay, well, I'll go and do the whole rest of the area. And that easily led to the next um, topic, which was when Detroit wrote the waves, because so for the first 50 years of, of, um, of clubs and hotels up on the flats, the only practical way to get there was the excursion boats. And so you couldn't study that area without that era without studying something about the boats and then coming to uh, becoming aware that Detroit had the largest fleet of passenger boats in the country. Um, I, as to, a number I came up with after I did the book um, was that in 1897, there were five million passengers registered by the, um, the government agency that regulated steamships in going in and out of Detroit. Now, the comparable number for Chicago, which has always been a larger city, was 500,000. And in 1912, that number had risen to 10 million in Detroit and 1 million in Chicago. So I don't know what the New York um, Harbor's numbers were, but I understand that we had the largest fleet any place. And there were a lot of places to go. Right? People would go to the flats, they'd go down to the Lake Erie Islands, they'd go to Pablo, they'd go to Belle Isle. Um, and um, so, it, so, so that led to doing when Detroit wrote the waves, uh, which had another component to it. The early illustrations I wanted to tell my stories um, often only survived in postcards. 
And fortunately, there were a lot of postcard collectors. And coincidentally, Detroit was the home of the leading postcard manufacturer of the country. Um, Detroit Publishing Company published scenes all over the country, but uh, really covered Detroit area well because its owners and founders were um, members of the waterfront clubs. Uh, so a lot of that survived. So I did a history of postcards, which is just kind of an aside. Now all of this time, I really had started on another topic, which I still haven't finished, which was going to be the history of Gray Marine. But I started noticing connections between all of the names started coming up when I was researching the, the St. Clair Flats during this 1890 boom period. And in 1890 started to fascinate me. And I started to try to look into some of the antecedents of the automotive and um, engine boom in the early 20th century. And what I started to find was that all of the people we know of as the automotive pioneers today, all of those people who founded automobile companies in Detroit by, say, 1903, which covers all of the biggies, had all, every one of them, built and sold marine engines prior to producing a car, or producing a production car. Um, I say that only so I can keep including Ford in it. Um, but we we'll start with David Buick. David Buick had no intention of making a car. He had no interest in making a car. He, he's the person who gave us um, uh, modern bathrooms and toilets because he was the American inventor of um, bonding porcelain to cast iron. So he would have been a wealthy man um, just staying in, in, in that industry. But he became fascinated with engines. And he was a yachtsman, and he was a uh, vice commodore at the Detroit Yacht Club about the time he and his partner had a, had a falling out. And he was interested in marine engines. He was interested in yachting. Um, I started finding clippings of his yachting accomplishments. I started reading reviews of people who were using his engines. Uh, so really, for the last 20 years, I've been collecting these kind of little tidbits. Um, so I'll stay with Buick for, for a moment. In, I do it. Yeah, I, I said I was going to outline the book a little bit. So I cover a couple things in the in, in the book. Once I got to this, is I do biographies as they relate to their green engine and early automotive experiments of some key people: Buick, Ford, um, Olds, uh, Daimler. A couple names you haven't heard of, or maybe not well: King and Since. I'll get back to them. Um, I also do two chapters, one early that I don't think has ever been done any place, which was the pre-Gold Cup era of powerboat racing. And then I do the early era of powerboat racing. Um, Gold Cup started in 1903, and I go up to about 1912. And for that purpose was to show how many contributions to engine development came out of powerboat racing such as hemi heads, um, aluminum blocks. Um, and then I also introduced all of the types of choices or techno technologies that could be used for building engines that would power boats and cars. And that was steam, that was electric, that was internal combustion, and it was the missing link. That in the early 1880s, the very first owner-operated operate, um, self-powered transportation vehicle in the world was a boat, and it was the naphtha engine, which I'd always read about naphtha engines in the, in the early years, and I thought they were some crude form of a gasoline engine. And what I learned is they were some, of the, it was the bridge between steam and internal combustion. It was a engine developed and patented in 1883 to get around the steamship regulation laws that, that um, in federal waters you could not operate a steamboat of any size without a licensed engineer. And of course, even well, and all the space it took up with the fuel and the, um, and the boilers. And so a guy named Frank Oldfeld in New York um, invented a, a steam 
type engine, but by definition, steam is boiled water. So the regulation spoke about steam engines. So he made a compact engine um, and boiled gasoline in it. And he used gasoline as the fuel for the burner. So it only required one tank hidden up in the bow, previously unused space, and a, and a unitized engine boiler um, in the stern. So it now opened up all of the mid area of the boat and an owner or operator could take it out. Well, it took about five minutes to um, heat up the boilers. And um, not only that, it, um, no gas, gas engine at the time operated on a liquid fuel. Liquid fuels had to wait for um, workable carburetors. So in the early 1880s, the, the technological leap was made by a little engine that boiled gasoline, but it, it had a portable fuel, could be operated by an owner, um, and it was, um, by all standards of the day, clean, efficient. Um, they operated on a technology that people were pretty familiar with, and it popularized power loading. And the NAPSA engine became very popular, um, very widely used uh, among the very wealthy, because um, it was very expensive. And in interestingly, it was um, oil money was behind the inve investment in it, uh, because that was an age of transition from, um, from gas lanterns to electricity, so they were looking for another use of, of the gas. So there was a lot of reasons to, to promote it, and um, it popularized power boating. It's what got people, it is what got people thinking about <coughs> self-powered personal transportation in a way that we have completely forgotten. Um, and I, and why, did, why did we forget this? Why did that come up in any other history book of the automotive era that I'd ever read? And the only answer I come up with is when automotive historians were writing about automotive history, they were looking for automotive stuff. <laughs> and if the, uh, the people they were studying had ventured off into some other things that they considered superfluous, they just dropped the whole idea. So, as I say, for 20 years I've been collecting all the little links I found. And, um, and then by, in the 1880s, um, electricity was coming on board, and electric boats were, were um, reasonably popular. Um, Chicago World's Fair, that great technological um, exposition of 1893, there were 50 electric boats being used at the, at the fair, and there were two gas-powered boats, one a Daimler, and one has since. And half of those electric boats were built in Detroit. Of the two engine, of the, the Daimler engine and the since engine, everybody's heard of the Daimler, I'm sure, and, and, but you haven't heard of who was building them and selling them. That was Mr. Steinway of the piano fame. He was he, he was a licensee in, in, in the United States of Canada, and that started in 1891. In the fall of 1895, 19, in, in 1890, early 1896, he, he wrote um, that he was disillusioned with the gas engine and the drain it was causing on him um, and his uh, lack of will to prevent it. Uh, he died that fall, and, and the executors uh, wrote his $200,000 investment in the Daimler engine off as worthless. The, the internal combustion engine had, was just about ready to reach a, a level of perfection that would have made it interesting. But in 1896, he, would, he was frustrated he could not outsell the NAPSA engines. He was building the, the boats that he was putting these engines in with the same reputation of quality and, um, as the pianos that were coming out of the same factories in Steinway, New York, but it, it, it wasn't, wasn't making it. Instead, it was still the, Daimler, it was still the um, NAPSA, but the other engine that was there was the Synths. And if, anybody here for that? Any, do I get any hands up on that? No. Okay. The Synths engine is the engine that's in the oldest um, American-made um, internal combustion-powered automobile in the Smithsonian. But he was building 
marine engines. And he was building them in Grand Rapids. Between the early 1890s and the late 1890s, Grand Rapids was the country's center of small gas engines. There were a number of manufacturers there. Exactly why it happened, one fed off the other, I don't know. But since ended up down in Detroit, um, uh, Wolverine ended up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and two others that aren't part of my story ended up um, down here as, as well. To a couple people saw the SIMS engine, and preferring it at that time over the Daimler, bought ordered copies of it. One was Charles Brady King, and the other was um, Elwood Haynes. Elwood Haynes did build a car with his, and the people he had helped him do that included Jonathan Maxwell. Um, and that was in 1894, and that's the car that's in the Smithsonian. Um, Charles King studied it for a while and played with it, and he was, he was more of an inventor than he was ever going to be a manufacturer. And he decided that it wasn't appropriate for what he wanted to do, so he used it for an air pump. But he did develop the first in-block four-cylinder engine in this country and used it to power the first car produced in Detroit, to ride the streets of Detroit. It was unveiled in the spring of 1896. But he didn't go on to build more. He partnered with Henry Joy to manufacture the King Marine engine. And the King Marine engine um, eventually was acquired by, by Olds Motor Works and was the principal part of the Olds Motor Works Marine Engine Division before they were manufacturing cars. Um, I don't have a script, so I'm just <laughs> uh, hoping that I can keep your attention as I walk, walk through this. Um, it, 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 and this really is, I ended up with the book because I was trying to tie together and explain why this was all important so I could go on to my next project. And there's so much of this that has just been completely overlooked. So now again, let's grab some old. Um, so much myths surround the early years, and one of them is that Ransom Olds uh, built the, the first purpose-built automotive factory in Detroit. Well, that's not true at all, and although he and his partner, the, the Smiths, um, really started to really dislike each other when they split up, both of them agree that the company was brought from Lansing to Detroit, and the factory was built to produce engines. Engines by, 19, by 1899, when he came here, were starting to be big money. Too bad for Daimler, I mean, too bad for Steinway. You know, he didn't make it to that point, but in 1899, it was starting to be big business and starting to be big money. And they, and Ransom Olds and um, Charles King were producing marine engines. Um, that's when Buick started to get into the picture. Um, Ransom Olds had started in the 1880s building engines, um, was father before him, uh, mostly steam engines, but by the early 1890s, he was then experimenting with gas engines. Um, he also built and operated his first gasoline-powered car in 1896. So the Ford, King, and Olds all introduced their gas-powered cars, but what we forget about Olds is in 1889 and 1892, he built a steam-powered cars. And then he went on to experiment with electric-powered cars. And in, in 1901, the engine business was booming. He went on his usual winter vacation. He came back and read in the train station the, the morning's paper that said his factory had burned down the night before. And nobody, I don't believe anybody else could have done this. He, he had experience in manufacturing. He was a successful manufacturer. And so he knew what to do. And he converted the foundry into the assembly plant. And they decided to build the one product that, he, that he'd been pushing. And so he won the vote that day. And they started building his curved dash Oldsmobile. 
not because it was the only pattern designs or plans that survived the fire, which is another myth. It's because that's what his vision was. It was an inexpensive car powered by his light engine, and that year he immediately became the world's largest manufacturer of gas-powered automobiles. Went from marine engines to the world's largest manufacturer of gas-powered automobiles overnight. So subsequently that year he sold off the King Engine Division um, and it went to a boat building company that's where Brighton Naval Armory is today, which er, um, less than a year before had already bought since. And so now we had a, the, what was the world, what was uh, short lived but the largest manufacturer of pleasure, powered pleasure boats in the country, having a two cycle division and a four cycle division. And King went over there to work there before he went on in 1902 to be one of the key people with Maxwell and founding the, the Northern Manufacturing Companies, Great Northern. Um, so we got Olds in 1901, rain engine manufacturer. We've got um, King and, and Maxwell in 1902, rain engine people. Um, Buick didn't build his first car until 1903, marine engine guy. Um, even after he moved to Flint, their catalog, the first catalog for Olds Motor Works in Flint did not have an automobile in it. It had marine engines, it had engines that they were making available for other people if they wanted for automobiles, but we forget, they were engine people. Um, and we've got Henry Leland, and Henry Leland um, had been making gas engines in the 1890s. If you read the book, um, Masters of Precision, they refer to them by talking about Kleenex or Lifesavers that he made NAPTA engines in the 1890s. No, he didn't. That's what people were calling this stuff. He made um, gas engines and uh, under contract. And he was also known as you know, the finest machinist in town. And so he was well prepared to s step in to pick up where Ford had left off at, and, and create Cadillac. And Ford, the, since there, I, I was kind of looking for how does Ford fit in here because I figured if, ev if everybody else does, and everybody wants to hear about Ford because Ford gets you know, all the credit for doing everything, that how does he fit in the story? <laughs> well, um, I found a letter from one of his investors. Um, it's, this is in 1897, uh, sp spring of 1897, discussing, I know this is in the fall of 1897, discussing, as he said, why Ford's engines that he sold work well in boats. And he went on to explain my theory. And he said, that I don't think they yet are appropriate for a land vehicle. And as he explained that in a boat, uh, an early one-cylinder engine could backfire and miss and would keep on going. And, and, and if it was in an automobile, if it was on the slightest incline and hit the slightest bump and it missed, it would come to a stop. So it, it took that. that really woke me up to how the technology was being developed on the water. That's where people would buy it. That's where people were willing to, to take the smelly, noisy, um, crude um, machinery and use it where they had no other options but to row or to sail. And on land, we had lots of other options. So that seemed quite logical that we know Ford wasn't a wealthy man after he built his toy-like quadricycle. Um, and then he didn't build his next car you know, for years. Um, he continued to tinker, he continued to build engines, but he too sold them. And then the other one is, the only other Ford book that I've ever read that even alluded to it was um, Sidney Olson's book, uh, The Young Henry Ford. To my surprise, he devoted a page and a half to it and discussed um, a lawsuit where um, he had to sue Mr. Hurlbut for non-payment of the marine engine he had built for him because Hurlbut said it didn't work. 
That was in the early 1897. So those were the engines that in the later in 1897, the investor was saying how he knows how that they work well. So now I've at least got multiple engines that Ford had been making. And that was enough for my story. Uh, so Ford was doing it too. Um, and he would build one engine, he'd sell it, he'd go on and build his next one. And that's just intuitively how he developed um, a, working, a working engine. Uh, he didn't build his first one. Um, the, first, the first automobile magazine in this country came out in, in the fall of 1895. And it's got the engine that we all recognize as the engine in Ford's quadricycle. And the manufacturer of that was using it on boats and on motorcycles. And so, so OK, that's it. <laughs> now, I'll, now I'll give you some slides. Um, I'm sorry, no, one more second. On the racing, prior to the Gold Cup races, it is very interesting to know how many of the competitors were using um, the various types of options available. Um, naphtha, gas, and electric. I mean, the first race of any importance in our area for power boats was in 1897. It was in the Interlakes Yachting Association to put in day week. And um, most of them were naphtha. And the one gas engine was a since, And it was by a Detroiter who went down and kind of cleaned up. And that started to, you know, to make people more aware of the, um, of the speed and ability of a gas engine, started helping that transition. And then, and then it occurred to me, um, this was the most boring, boring part of my research. I spent a full day down at the library going through microfilm because I suspected that if the first automobile race of any importance in this area was in October of 1901, it was made famous by um, at the Detroit horse track, Gross Point horse track, racetrack, um, and Henry Ford beat Alexander Winton. The promoter of that race was um, William Metzger. Well, I searched and I searched, and I found that in July of 1900, William Metzger was the promoter. Um, as race chairman for the Detroit Yacht Club of the first powerful race in Detroit. So I, I, I just knew that had to happen, that the sequence of events was that it was a powerful race. And there were many more competitors that day than there were in the automobile race. Um, the press reports were saying how surprised they were that so many boats came um, to turn out. And then I did not expect this, but this then uh, convinced me that I was the one who was supposed to write this book because I found that the winner of that race was my great grandfather. And that was just kind of eerie. <laughs> um, so then we get into, then I go in the next section and I get into the um, gas era. Um, but there were still some, some racing steam engines and some naphthas and some electrics um, almost up until uh, 1912. 1912 is the first year that a gas-powered race boat beat a steam boat. I mean, I didn't even match them, but the, the, this world's water speed record was held by a steamboat until 1912 when an all-out racer beat the record for the first time. So there was a lot of development that had to go on on the gas engines to, to to exceed the performance expectations of what a good steam engine could provide. Um, so, do I have a clicker here? Yep. Oh. Yeah. Well, this, I apologize for, for the slides, but they will um, serve to illustrate something here. Um, if. Mike, Mike, these are all illustrations from the book. Right? Yes, they're much better quality in the book. Um, if people wanted cars, they could have had cars a hundred years earlier. Now we've all heard of lots of experiments. But this one in 1801, uh, right um, um, Mr. Trevisek in England built a working 
automobile. But he became, thought it was not such a cool idea. They were too awkward. It was too hard to control on the roads. So he's the father of railroads. He said, let's put these things on rails. In 1803, in this country, Oliver Evans was commissioned to build a, a steam dredge for the Philadelphia Harbor, and his shop was inland, so he built it and um, made it amphibious. And he drove it around for a while before, and did some demos with it, and um, before it slipped into the Philadelphia Harbor and went scurrying off doing its dredging, and never again was he asked to build it on land power vehicle. Oh, do I have that option? Yeah, right there. You should be able to right there. Okay. Need some air. Okay, now I'm guaranteed to fall asleep. Okay, um, now it's steamboats or steam powered boats um, were advancing much further than steam-powered rails. Um, um, so they, they had already had steamboats in the 1700s. And the first one on the Great Lakes was 1817, and that was the walk in the water. And I gave this lecture last winter, and in, and in the audience was the uh, rector of, of uh, Mariners Church, and he told me that the first pass, I mean, on that first trip was the, the woman who gave the donation to found Mariners Church. But uh, um, so I have this here to point out how important Detroit became early on, and it could have been Toledo. I'm not sure why it wasn't Toledo, really, um, but it was a D Buffalo to Detroit run. And Detroit very early became the steamship entrepot for people continuing on west or into the upper Great Lakes. And one of the ones that replaced it, again, it's Buffalo to Detroit. And that has a lot to do with you know, our, our focus in Detroit pre-automotive on the waterfront. And I can't see that very well. It's just showing some of the other routes. Um, and so when we get to the era when I was working on the St. Clair Flats history, um, Toledo to Port Huron and all the stops people could make on, on excursion boats, um, again, to emphasize how many places there were to go and my belief that with five million people on, on the decks of these excursion boats passing through in and out of Detroit. It didn't take very many percentage-wise to be looking over the rails and seeing the pioneer first the NAPS operators. Well, Mr. Westcott of the, of the mailboat was one of them, um, just to give a name, and to see them moving at their own schedule, at their own pace, and a few more people saying that I'd like to do that. You know, so again, Detroit had that mass of people. Um, that it just took a few more here and a few more there to start experimenting and start getting other people interested in it. Um, the top shot is, is the first um, powered ferry boat in Detroit that ran from Detroit to Windsor. I think you can see it was exactly two horsepower. And the one below is the, the first steamboat built and based in Detroit, and that was the Argo. And it was designed, its first year was for the purpose of running from Detroit to Port Huron, and it could make the trip in three days. But the next year, it, um, Captain Lewis Davenport leased it and began the first powered ferry service between Detroit and Windsor. Well, that's just more than a little interesting. His daughter married George um, Russell, who became the founder of, of the first 
you know, so, um, uh, well, Detroit's in, in early industrial founder building rail rail wheels, um, and and his his son, so his grandson um, was also the first president of Olds Motor Works after Ransom Olds left, and his other grandson was Charles King. They all tie in. <laughs> Um, that's just a typical scene around the 1840s, um, and the, one in the foreground was Oliver Newberry's um, ship, which was the first um, serious, um, prestigious steamship built in Detroit. And another typical scene around uh, the early 1900s, um, as you can see, um, the, the the ferries between Detroit, uh, the Black Hall boat there is a DNC, the overnighters, the rest were the Greyhound in the foreground, which was probably running down to Toledo, and that's probably the Tash in the background, which was getting ready to run up at um, Port Huron. Um, there were three round trips a day between Detroit and Port, Port Huron then. And by, by, the, by 1900, a lot, all the competition had been going on, and the number of fleets had all really consolidated into the White Star Line. And um, anybody here ever ride the Taj Mahal? And I got careful in what I say. I thought I was very young. Anybody here never ride one of the excursion boats, um, like the, like the Bobble boat? When did they retire the Taj Mahal? When it sank in um, 1936. 36? Yes. And then it was um, partitioned off, and the um, pilot house became a cottage up near Wallsburg until it burnt in 1951, I think. Um, but the Tasmo was 300 feet, and the Bible boats were 200 feet, just to give you kind of a perspective. Um, Just a few ships that should drive home the type of fleets we had here. Um, they also served not only for passengers, but I mean, there was a lot of economic viability for them in, at, at that time because they did carry some cargo and they were post offices. I mean, all these stops could not be reached by any place else but boat. So they were also um, post offices and you'd get stamped, you know, rural free delivery southbound and northbound. I don't know, a casual point out of the Detroit Harbor. But it, had a, it had an unusually um, complete um, collection of uh, accommodations. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was on the inaugural run. Um, a lot of people arrived in Detroit who didn't have any other interest than to get the next boat to get up to Lake Huron and get their either their excursion or their rest away to Chicago. So you could get some private rooms, or uh, private dining room. Huh. Um, you'd be picked up in Detroit by, in 1912, this was a 1912 electric cab. I mean, again, gas engines weren't, weren't necessarily the answer yet. Um, you'd get a two hour um, tourist ride. So many people came through here waiting for layovers between one ship to the next. Um, this, this did a two-hour tour of the city. Another typical scene showing the overnighters. I don't really address the overnighters, but they deserve serious consideration as well. Uh, That's like the last one we all remember, or some of us remember. This is one that really uh, got me um, interested in, in the ships as well. I found almost the same identical picture and the same news clipping um, in two family scrapbooks. Like two of my great grandfathers were, were on the boat. I don't know if they knew each other then, but each of them ended up with a scrapbook with, with that picture in it. And they weren't stuck. This was the first trip of the season and they had stopped to refill the boilers. And the destination was to get to the old club. And then those who wanted to go further went up on the ice uh, on their own. And, and things had to 
change that much because in the clipping it said they reported, those people went up to check their places and came back, but just reported the normal amount of pilfering during the winter. Um, that's Pablo Island, um, and the, the lower left is the, the, the dock for the, you know, for many years you can only get there by boat. Uh, did I say Pablo? Yeah, that's Pablo Island. Uh, but you know, there's a big missing piece there. And I find that particularly telling of our story that that missing piece that we now know where the Scotch Fountain is um, wasn't created until 1926, and it was the fill from the last major expansion of the Detroit urban rail system. People weren't driving cars all year back then. That was the, also the first year that enclosed automobiles outsold open automobiles. You know, with all this, the, the success and lots of money being made in automobiles in, in that first quarter of a century, it was still toys for a lot of people. And they were using them in the summer, but um, the vast majority of people put them away in their garages for the winter or in their barns. And that's why there's so many collectibles still around, because they got put away in their barn and the only person who knew how to drive it um, died or Stop, just stop driving it, and nobody else in the family had, knew what to do with it, and covered up with hay and left it there. So, I mean, that's... Oh, well, again, this is show all the places people could go. If you're not familiar with the St. Clair Flats, Parsons Island, I mean, it's, it's the fifth largest delta in the world. So it's one thing to get up there on, your, on the ferry boat to the major stops, and then get somebody who would shuttle you over to your place, but there were just lots of places you would want to go to. Acts 1936. The last regularly scheduled pet excursion boat going up the uh, across Lake Clay Claire and up in the St. Clair River was the Putin Bay. And it was purposely set up by her, I think it was in 53, and it was just right out here, and it was and it was set up at, as a spectacle. Um, it was done to clear the superstructure um, so they could scrap the iron. And then that's the last of, of the fleet. Now, oh, it's a little high, but that's okay. Um, Keep going. This is what was in 1873 considered a semi-portable engine. And that's not even showing all the, all the space and bulk you needed to have to, to have your fuel. Um, that's the boiler. And the little thing is the engine. A uh, typical drawing of a, of a steamboat, as you can see, really the, the engine, the boiler, um, took up the center third of the boat. Um, and then just the coal was stored in every place else you could stick it. And that just didn't leave much room. But they were, as a a small one, but it's, again, you can see um, the, the guy, the guy in the back is 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 working the boiler. Doesn't leave much room for for passengers there, and the, and the operator, uh, he's got room for another person there. Is that the flat like? Yeah, yeah. That's behind the rush here. Um, this is by comparison. Actually, it worked before the show, but <laughs> okay. Well, that's an apple launch, and as you can see, the, the the chimney there. That's the whole boiler, and it's sitting on top of the engine, so no other space is being wasted. The fuel for for both is up under the bow, and then. A keel cooling system allowed the expanded naphtha um, to cool and condense and go back to the holding tank. And uh, there's a diagram of it again three cylinders, 
uh, boiler, heel cooling. Very, very, for, for the time, it was a revolutionary advancement in, in personal transportation. This was an early gas engine. Most of that is the base, the stand, the, the flywheel. You know, this is the engine. Everything else is here to support it. <laughs> um, this is what it, this is what it ran some old early gas engines. Um, but it was a stationary engine. It was the gas tank and the water cooling tank and not much of, of an engine here. But the other thing that took a while to develop was um, ignitions, electric ignition. This was a, a burner to keep the hot tube, tube it operated more like a diesel. So they had kept a, um, a, a hot tube ignition and um, um, you know, the Daimlers well into the 90s late 90s, um, oh, look at that, huge contraption. Yeah, that's it. This is the engine, this is the carburetor, and this is the burner for, it, for his hot tube ignition. There's Daimler in his first, first boat. Well, I know it's not his first boat, but this is the one first started getting a lot of publicity and showed up in their ads. This was his first boat, 1886. In a news clipping that I had translated, um, it said that he would operate his boats in, in the early morning, and he would have his um, staff go and install the engine in the middle of the night because people were scared to death of gas engines. And so at least on the water, you could get away from everybody. I mean, on land, people, gas scared people. And it exploded, it made noises. And nobody, anybody who could afford this you know, personal transportation vehicle in that era, they were raised to aspire to a fine leather carriage. The last thing they wanted was to be sitting on top of an exploding, oil splattering um, contraption. That's why the automobile industry didn't start in Detroit. It, the, the American automobile industry was pretty well established in Hartford, Connecticut, and they made thousands of electric cars in the late 1890s. Thousands, not you know, a couple like we made in Detroit. One of their damn Daimler. Daimler didn't give a hook about what, what his engines went into, because he was just an engine guy. This is one of, um, this was 1889, it was um, um, Bismarck, called Bismarck's launch. The family gave it back to the Daimler and it's in their museum today. But this, this, was, this is what Daimler put most of his engines into in the beginning. And he's quoted as saying that it was the power boat, the marine engine, that did more than anything else to create an acceptance for the gas engine. That's his, that's his 1887 version. Uh, I wish you could see that better. Um, so here's the 1887 Paris World's Fair. And exhibiting there was both his launch, which we saw earlier in another picture, and on land is that car that I just showed you. I hope you can see it. I can't see it from here. But um, it's a really good image in the book. And then this is a, a Daimler poster um, where most things of any one type are boats. You've got some fire trucks and some street cars and um, you don't really have much in the way of what we consider to be automobiles, but you should have a lot of boats. Uh, another misnomer, uh, another myth, is that the 
on the board was invented in Detroit in 1906, or um, uh, the Waterman became the first commercially successful, continuously manufactured um, outboard. But this was an 1887 outboard, and the reason well, um, Waterman said that he didn't patent or copyright um, the name outboard because somebody else had already done that 30 years before for a outboard steam engine. Here's the electrics. Electrics had a, a, a lot of advantages that I've been describing over the steam engine. Um, the engine and the power source could not only be out of the way, but be down low and provide extra stability. And, and at the time, you know, they said, okay, electric boats won't go that far. Or electric automobiles wouldn't go that far. Well, nobody had any expectations of going that far. <laughs> this gave them great mobility. Um, but it became, it was the most expensive choice. These are the ones used at the Chicago World's Fair. And there's Mr. Mr. Steinway backwards, but. And, sorry, you can't see that, but the page was first catalog, 1891. And so it's gas and petroleum motors. So when we talk about gas back then, we're talking about um, gas, not gasoline. Um, and the use, street railroad cars, pleasure boats, carriages, Oh, here's what I say. He wrote that I had serious apprehensions as to the Montreal look and court and, and cursed the Daimler Motor Company for its trading me of money and resolved to stop it. And then he died in November, and his $181,000 investment um, was declared worthless. There's our Sims engine um, from Scientific American covering the World's Fair. And here's the first car it got put in, you can use a much better image in the book, and you can see it in the Smithsonian. Um, there's a strip down for... Um, Duryea's are credited with being the first um, multiple copy produced automobile in, in the country. Um, and then the two brothers split up and both of them ended up making marine engines. Charles King, um, well, I just think it's critical to the Detroit story, and he was such an inventive fellow. Um, he, he won up um, awards at the Chicago World's Fair for his pneumatic hammers and sold should, up. You should note the other stockholders. Oh, I wanted to get yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Henry, Henry Joy and, and John Newberry. Um, they were the Joy. Um, his sailboat log is filled with ventures with King and Newberry. And they, they were good friends. So the, nobody has an answer to why they didn't go into the automobile business together. And I think the answer simply is that Charles King was just so much more of a, an inventor and a fantasizer and a good friend that you know the engine business was one thing, but when um, when Joy wanted to go in the automobile business, it, it wasn't because he got sprayed by a steam engine, another myth that goes around. He knew as much as any other businessman in that era about gas engines. So he knew he wanted to get into gas engines. And he and Mr. Packard were peers in very many ways. Um, Mr. Packard like Joy was the son of a very wealthy man. Neither of them had to, had to work. Both of them were very interested in, in, in technology and advancement, especially Packard. He was, he was a very hands-on inventor. And, um, and, had, and they both were yachtsmen. Um, Packard had a NASA launch. He's listed in the, you know, the Ask the Man Who Owns One catalog for, um, for the NASA engine manufacturer. So it was, it really was quite natural that they got talking. There is Henry Joy in the, in the demo launch. And that's um, the engine you might recognize as powering the quadricycle. 
and it was a first appearing in January, reported in the January 1895 motorcycle show in New York. And here's the letter from Ellery Garfield, who made it through the first two foreign investments. And he says, I do not wonder that you are somewhat discouraged as I am, for Mr. Ford seems to have difficulties as well as all the others. I have, in my mind, a very serious doubt as to whether the gasoline engine um, are the proper thing for motor carriages, or for that matter, any power that is produced by explosion. And he went on explaining, you know, what I was talking about. But he says, I can readily see how some of the engines Mr. Ford has made and sold for small boats and work very well. Well, that's plural. So we, you know, um, this is uh, Molson's reference to the engine that they built for Will Hurlbert's Hurlbut's yacht, and it stalled, and Hurlbut refused to pay. Um, there's the, oh, that's uh, it's Highland Park Racetrack, um, which in 1906 might have been included on your tour of Detroit, and then you know, the things were just exploding by 1912. Um, the, I'm just not telling the slides, no, um, the, the first, the first product produced at the Ford River Rouge plant was a boat, an eagle boat, and it, he hired the, the foremost naval architect who designed most of our excursion boats and most of the old, those overnighters and also the person that Ford credited with saving his life. Um, what's his name? Kirby. Kirby, Frank, Frank Kirby. And he has on his Hall of Heroes at, um, at the Henry Ford, Kirby's up there with him. Um, this is an old Motor Works ad from 1901. This is when they were still next to the uh, Belle Isle Bridge. Right. Belle Isle Bridge today. There's um, a letter from Thomas Buick in night, fall of 1903. Haven't yet. They're on their way to Flint, and he's discussing um, their marine engines and writing to boat builders and telling them that you know up to now you may not have heard of us because we can we can sell everything we manufacture by word of mouth locally. But we're moving to a new plant in Flint that's going to be state of the art, and we're going to have some serious production, and we want you to know about it because we want you to buy it. And what Buick is famous for, it's the concept of the overhead valves. Um, a new book on Buick does discuss in more detail that he really wasn't the first to do it, but he was the first one to really make a lot of accomplishments with it. And his original reason for doing it was so that you didn't have to pull the engine out of the boat. You could take the head off and take it in for having work done on it. That was the only thing described in this catalog, the only purpose for it. Um, all the people that we've discussed or that you've heard about um, were only, you know, this. Uh, um, a, a few of the many, and um, what the heck is his name? Um, oh, uh, Bloom, Bloomstrom. Bloomstrom was one of the most prolific inventors and involved with more automobile companies than anybody else I can find, but that wasn't the importance. He started out building marine engines, he built cars, but in 1901, he was building a boat, and oh, 1903, a boat and engine combination for $100. And he couldn't keep up the production, and he was contracting um, boats from others. Um, I'm sure about the hacker crafts, so the, 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 the Steinways of, of boats, as they used to be called until now, I realized, until I learned that Steinway actually did build boats. So, um, but. But that was um, 
one of the first three point or one of the first hydroplane three point hydroplanes um, built, and that was one of his. That's the overhead valve hemi head um, that powered the um, first yeah internal combustion engine boat that beat this the speed record. And I, my story really starts, really ends around 1912 when we went from the boat that's not making it on the screen to the transition to um, the, the Chris Smith boats um, and the small overpowered boats that couldn't be used for anything else except racing compared to the other ones that had displacement hulls and, um, and when they weren't racing they would use it for family boats. And then, and then, but doesn't cover these, because, uh, um, but, you know, then things evolved into the huge Packard engine powering Gar Woods boat. Um, uh, and that's it. Let's go away. <laughs> But I got some bookmarks out there. You're welcome to take. It's got my web page on it and a phone number if you want to follow up. And, and there's copies of your book, three got, books in the back. There's copies of my books in the back, and you can see them on my web page. Um, no other book I can make with. Okay, well, we come for other programs, but I want to thank you very much for coming.